We ready back there? Yes? Okay, good. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the audience uh, in the room. Welcome uh, to our online audience. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to be able to introduce uh, Congressman Blumenauer. For those of you that are CSIS veterans, we had him here to do kind of the same thing when he took over the Trade Subcommittee a number of years ago, and he uh, laid out what, what his plans were at the time. Uh, now, sadly, he's retiring at the end of this year, uh, and so we're having him here not really as a valedictory because it's too early to give a valedictory. Maybe we'll have him back towards the end of the year. But I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for, I think, him and also so for those of you that are interested in trade policy, which I hope is everyone listening, uh, to get uh, have a chance to reflect uh, on the last few years of trade policy and in particular uh, what he's done and what uh, he hopes to accomplish uh, in his remaining time. Uh, I'm not going to do a complete biography. I think most of you most of you know him. He's a prominent figure in the trade field. He is currently the ranking member of the Trade Subcommittee uh, because uh, the other party has a majority right now. But prior to that, he was the chairman of the subcommittee and uh, was chairman during uh, a time when a number of actually landmark things happened, uh, including um, uh, the USMCA agreement, where I think he played a, uh, an important role in getting that done, and getting it done with a bipartisan vote that was probably stronger than any other trade agreement that Congress has act, uh, acted on, despite the controversy of trade agreements these days. That one got nearly 400 votes, as I recall. Um, uh, interestingly, one or two more votes from Democrats than from re Republicans. Um, he's also uh, was has been very involved in the issue of illegally harvested timber and wood products uh, in the timber annex to the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement and Lacey Act amendments. Uh, this has been a long-standing interest of, of his, and I think probably in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's an important issue uh, there. Uh, he also has been uh, a leader in a number of trade issues uh, near and dear to my heart, and particularly uh, trade adjustment assistance, which we can't see to get, seem to get across the finish line, but uh, in which I'll ask him about if, if he doesn't talk about it in his, in his comments. Um, so uh, I think someone who has compiled a really distinguished record of, of tr on trade policy during his time in the Congress, and someone who is thoughtful about it, thinks about it, uh, and uh, cares about uh, where our country is going on trade policy. So what we're going to do is, having said that, uh, the congressman's going to come up and make some remarks, and then I'm going to join him here on the st stage. We'll have a, a conversation, and then uh, we'll take questions from the audience. So, Congressman. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thanks for your hospitality. Uh, I always feel smarter when I talk to you about trade. I enjoy the conversations and I look forward to what we're doing. Uh, it is a time for me to uh, sort of reflect on uh, 54 years of full-time <laughs> political service. Uh, nothing like we've experienced of late, uh, but it's a good time to, to reflect. And I've been thinking a little bit about how things were different when I came back here. I, I was focused on being on the Ways and Means Committee from the beginning. My campaign chair was Al Omens, Chief of Staff. Uh, guided me to Janice Mays. Uh, I chaired a revenue committee in the state legislature, was interested in trade and tax, and that was kind of where I was zeroed in. I did a lot of, before I could get on the committee, I did a lot of uh, trade adjacent stuff and served on foreign affairs. But I found that I have a much different uh, perspective now than when I came. I bought into the notion that trade was going to uh, make some significant changes. I was in Hong Kong immediately before the transfer and there was this excitement about uh, uh, one China, two policies and the optimism of those, uh, uh, those folks that they'd be able to pull it off. Uh, I had a son who actually worked uh, for Nike, one of those uh, factory managers in Southeast Asia. I traveled extensively visiting him and uh, other businesses. The Pacific Northwest has a major footwear and apparel footprint, um, and I learned a lot uh, visiting those various communities. Um, had 
uh, different expectations, however. I mean, I bought into uh, China uh, being part of the WTO, uh, that somehow this was going to uh, have a moderating effect as they were part of the global economy and the partnerships. I was in China with Speaker Pelosi early in her tenure, had an opportunity to meet with Chinese leadership. We were talking about the green economy and, and cooperative efforts uh, dealing uh, in uh, their uh, implementing a lot of American uh, innovations, um, but they watching them take it to scale. It was really fascinating. It was also fascinating just interacting with the Chinese leadership. Uh, I found that they they all speak uh, English very well. Uh, I remember Jin Jumin correcting his interpreter uh, because the interpreter did not properly convey what he was saying. They're all engineers, and, and there was an, an era there of some cooperation. It was, um, uh, and it was kind of my first lesson. I was with Jin Jumin, um, and I had made some gratuitous offhand comment to him about hoping that uh, China was going to be able to be more reflective to democracy. This was 2001, and he looked at me and said, well, we have different opinions about democracy. Sometimes the people who get the most votes win. And I winced and thought about the 2000 uh, presidential election. I mean, this, this is uh, sort of uh, putting the kid in his place uh, by the old experienced China hand. Um, but I had a strong bias that this was a path towards making significant uh, changes uh, in society and the global economy. Uh, I supported virtually all the uh, tr trading initiatives. I, there, there are three, I think, that I didn't vote for. Um, we had, as Bill mentioned, some significant success. I was very pleased with what we did with the illegal logging, the, the Peru Free Trade Agreement, uh, the Lacey Act, uh, having uh, people being responsible for their supply chain made a difference. We had some 40% reduction in uh, uh, illegal logging as a result of that effort, and we provided legislation that modeled for the European Union, for the Australians, for uh, Canada, um, and it's uh, something that still makes a difference. Um, it's, I will say that um, there were some areas that were slightly contentious. Uh, I did not support TPP, but I broke with my party uh, and was, uh, went to the well when the rule was, was going down to change my vote so we could keep it moving forward. Uh, my goal was to try and improve that legislation. I, th I was one of the last people uh, who stopped lobbying uh, Froman and the administration to try and work with us on enforcement, for instance. I go to my grave thinking that if Hillary Clinton had been elected, we would have been able to work something together and not cede leadership to the Chinese. Um, it's, it, the, the attitudes that people have regarding trade promotion assistance, I don't think we should uh, tolerate partisan efforts at that. I voted against the one in 2002 when they were trying to jam the Democrats um, on uh, trade promotion authority. It didn't work out so well for them. Uh, they, didn't get Le they didn't beat Leonard Boswell. They probably strengthened him in Iowa. Uh, but it was, uh, it was not to be in terms of trying to force that through. It didn't work in, tw uh, uh, in 2002. Uh, it wouldn't work today. We need to lay the foundation to have that framework for uh, congressional relationship working with the administration with trade promotion authority. Um, it was interesting working with the Trump administration. I had uh, less than low expectations, but I really enjoyed working with Bob Lighthizer. He was a straight shooter. Uh, he had uh, modestly strong feelings about China. Uh, he worked with us uh, in terms of the, what we did with the speaker, with the, she uh, 
gave us a present of uh, adding four more people to the trade uh, working group, including a couple of folks who had never voted for a trade agreement, like uh, Rosa and Jan, um, but stuck with us, taking the time to work it through. And the commitment I made to Democrats when I took over the lead position was that my goal would be to find things that brought us together rather than divide us, and take the time to understand people's goals and objectives, work it through. Uh, we did that in terms of the revised NAFTA. We found that there was actually greater consensus about the need for environmental protections. You know, in fact, the critics of the original NAFTA were largely right. Poor Mexican farmers could not compete with large agribusiness in the United States. Uh, any more than the industrial heartland could compete with $3 an hour Chinese or uh, Mexican industrial workers. Um, the critique that they had was, was valid. Um, we took this to heart in terms of uh, having a revised NAFTA, and Bill's right. We actually had one more Democrat than Republican, uh, and it was an overwhelming bipartisan uh, legislation and the elements that we put in place that took time but they worked the rapid response working with the Mexican governor to government to try and deal with the 5,000 sham uh, unions uh, there were people in companies that didn't even know that they were represented by a union uh, trying to build the capacity with the Mexican uh, the new Mexican administration uh, took the time but it was worth it and we've seen since then um, very few hiccups. It seems to me that it's working as envisioned. And for me, that's kind of a model of what I'd like to see us do with trade policy generally. Uh, I would like us to be able to do a reset on a number of some of our uh, trade policies. Uh, I uh, have uh, strong concerns about finally pushing back on China. We were uh, unrealistic to expect that five, uh, 4,000 years of Chinese history uh, was that our 400 years of history would, would be uh, equal to the task. Um, it's outrageous to me that we still don't have a procurement policy with China. Uh, why are we allowing them to bid on projects in the United States when we've been denied that? Uh, pushing back, I think, is uh, not necessarily being belligerent, not having a trade war, but being real realistic and consistent, standing up for our interests. One of my current projects, um, my major priority concluding this Congress, is dealing with the de minimis provisions. I didn't know what we were doing in 2015 when we lowered the threshold to $800. I mean, it seemed like a, a reasonable effort to cut down on bureaucracy. And if Aunt Nellie came back with uh, $800 worth of perfume, she shouldn't have to fill out uh, tariff uh, paperwork. Little did we anticipate that the Chinese would build an entire industry predicated on being able to use this de minimis loophole. We are on a track. We're going to have one billion packages come into the United States this year. Uninspected, no tariff. We know to a certainty that some of it uses forced labor, which is an area that I've, I'm proud of the progress that we've made, um, that uh, exploding ch Chinese uh, uh, electric bike batteries uh, that under the $800 minimum. In fact, the $800 minimum is meaningless. You can talk to people and they're very happy to help you with what they call creative invoicing. They'll set the value to be able to get under the threshold. Nobody checks anyway. Uh, a meeting that we had with Customs and Border Patrol, uh, one of the people told me about a 50-pound box that had a $5 value that was attached to it. With a billion packages, 60% coming from China, there's no way that there's even a remote possibility that they'll deal with it. Now the latest trick 
uh, and we've had 15 uh, Republican attorneys general sound the alarm about how this is being used to ship drugs in the United States, precursors for fentanyl, directly to the home of the drug dealer. Uh, these are not theoretical. This is actually happening in, t in terms of slave labor. We've had the human rights folks come with us, speaking out in support of what we're doing. Uh, but what's happening to American business? They can't compete with this. We're having textile companies go out of business. A gentleman who came in who was involved with uh, by, uh, uh, bridal uh, supplies and dresses and whatnot, who's just being shut down because the Chinese are able to do this much faster, much cheaper um, than he ever could. Now, this is making a lot of jobs for FedEx, for uh, UPS. I mean, UPS, of course, as you know, started as a bicycle messenger service, so I have a, a soft spot in my heart for them uh, a century ago in Seattle. Um, but providing a lot of jobs with shipping for Amazon, for UPS, for FedEx, while we are dealing with illicit groups, forced labor, and putting American business out of business, seems to me to be a very poor bargain. We have bipartisan legislation that would close the, the de minimis loophole. Uh, it would deny de minimis treatment to any country that is a non-market economy on the watch list. And that is China, is the only country at this point. Um, and to those who complain that this is uh, uh, going to be burdensome for uh, Customs and Border Patrol, this will take care of 60% of those billion packages and requirements to try and track where it comes from to help simplify, uh, to be able to send a signal that we're going to be serious uh, and that we can have some bipartisan, bicameral legislation which I'd like to close out uh, my congressional career being able to enact. It's been a fascinating journey for me. Many of the theories about trade being able to raise standards of living, we've seen that in India, we've seen that in uh, Africa, but there are also problems associated with it and in terms of the, uh, what's the Chinese proverb, uh, the uh, mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Uh, you can have rules and regulations. You try and change things in terms of the contracting process. But this is complex and it is money driven and it's hard to be able to manage. Uh, I think that we have an opportunity in terms of going forward with areas like this, sending signals that we're going to stand up for what we believe in, that we are going to deal with strengthening Customs and Border Patrol, requiring people to have control of the chain of command, and using trade as an opportunity to deal with some seemingly intractable problems. The same uh, approach that we had with illegal logging, uh, I think, gives us an opportunity to deal with uh, commodities produced on illegally harvested forest land. We have bipartisan legislation that would deny access to the American market for the products that are um, uh, produced on this illegally harvested land. These are things that people understand. We're finding that there's also a, a, a pretty significant change, I think, in many of the attitudes regarding American business. As we plunged in dealing with, with uh, some of the human rights, dealing with uh, uh, environmental protections, uh, I think we've seen changes in terms of what's going on in terms of American business. People understand the reputational risks. Uh, the business people that I've worked with in the Pacific Northwest uh, had no interest in having little fingers stitch soccer balls. Um, uh, it's, it's not easy, again, dealing with the supply chains, but it's worth the effort. And I think we have an opportunity to make further progress on that. Uh, Bill, I can rattle on at greater length, but I'd much rather uh, have our conversation. Uh, your providing clarity and insight uh, is uh, much appreciated.
take this one. Okay, I'll take this one. Yeah, <laughs> good. Well, that gets us off to a good start. Um, and I'm glad you talked about de minimis because it means I don't have to ask you about it. We've already talked about that. Let's start um, for a moment with some sort of bigger picture questions. Uh, you're retiring after 28 years here, and a much longer career than that, as you pointed out. What's changed in the House since you got there? How is it different now than it was in the beginning? Um, there are three things. One, uh, just you cannot overstress the impact of social media. It has just sort of captured the process. Uh, another concern is that, and that helps everybody here who wants to be a free agent. Uh, the coin of the realm is attention, campaign contributions. The way you do that is by saying crazy things, um, being out there. Um, it r has its own rewards in terms of media attention and campaign contributions. And that really has a, a serious distorting effect. The other thing that concerns me is that we have fewer and fewer people who are here who care about the institutions. Uh, this is... Um, there's very little uh, uh, allegiance to regular order. I'm proud to serve in the Ways and Means Committee that is a little more traditional, but this is uh, something that uh, I never would have predict predicted. Uh, it's had a very serious effect in terms of the health of the institution, and it makes it harder to have the relationships that really help make this work. One of the, uh, I think, some of my least favorite words are, have become a cliche on the Hill, which is because everybody says it's working in a bipartisan way. Um, is that even possible these days? I, is it still important? And is it possible to do this? I mean, USMCA was an example, but now that was, what, five years ago or six years ago? Um, it is possible. Uh, every piece of legislation I introduce uh, is bipartisan. I have a number of good friends who are Republicans, uh, who without exception are part of what I would call the governing wing of the Republican Party, uh, sadly getting smaller. Um, and there are opportunities, uh, but usually it's when it aligns with some philosophic uh, or political imperative, not just bipartisanship. What we saw recently with Taiwan. Um, the uh, there is still an opportunity for bipartisanship, but it's overwhelmed by the imperative of the news cycle and the messaging that party leadership, I'll, I'll just say the Republican Party leadership, uh, feels they're captive to. You know, you've watched this week that they walked away from a deal that was negotiated at their request on immigration. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's stunning. Um, and something uh, high profile, uh, hot button issue like immigration, where 10 years ago we, we actually had bipartisan legislation that uh, Boehner wouldn't allow us to uh, vote on in the House after it passed the Senate. Um, uh, I don't think it's possible to have something for the immigration, even though immigration would solve so many of our problems in terms of the border, in terms of inflation, in terms of uh, unrest in Latin America and here. Uh, and I'm, I'm skeptical when it reaches that point where it is uh, the centerpiece of the next election that we can have that sort of bipartisan cooperation. Yeah, I guess the issue really is Getting not starting things, but getting them across the finish line. Yes, seems to be difficult. I was going to ask you about the Taiwan bill, so let me skip to that, um, because one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about is is uh, consultation with the executive branch. Uh, I mean, I spent 20 years up there, and I I don't think there was ever a trade agreement where Congress was happy with the level of consultation. Uh, and I think the Taiwan bill is a reflection of, of Congress's unhappiness now and. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but say a few words, if you can, about um, uh, whether people really are unhappy. Uh, is the current administration better or worse than previous administrations on consultation? Are we going to see more Taiwan bills, like on IPEF or critical minerals agreements or other things that might be out there? Uh, 
likely we will. I mean, it is, uh, it is, it is hard work to consult, and frankly, the administration has been uh, adverse in a number of areas. I mean, we're having uh, the functional equivalent of a, of a free trade agreement so they can sidestep congressional cons consultation. I think it's a mistake. Uh, I think that that breeds a sort of suspicion and challenges that could have been worked out as a result of interaction. Um, I strongly disagree with the notion that we're going to bypass the Ways and Means Committee, um, that they're going to lose an opportunity to have understanding and build momentum. Um, this is, uh, and, it's, and it's not just in terms of trade, this is something that is endemic, I think, in terms of how uh, Congress and administrations are, are operating. Um, and they, uh, there's a certain insularity. Um, and frankly, given the performance of Congress, I would be hard pressed to argue that they must invest heavily in that interaction. But I think failure to do so reinforces itself. Um, and it's, and it, it goes with some of the environmental problems. We, we talk about how difficult it is to, uh, uh, to work through the permitting process for infrastructure, which is a, a major area of success. Uh, but as a practical matter, uh, where we have problems with permitting is when they don't permit. They don't let the process work. And people become suspicious and they can't work out problems. Uh, that is a, an essential part of the legislative process, and I think we ignore it at our peril. We've had a working group here at CSIS, which has not been public, uh, that was attempting to deal with the, the trade promotion authority question. Uh, and it was a collection of lawyers and former this and that, and um, all. And we ended up focusing. We didn't. We weren't trying to draft a bill. We ended up focusing on the question of um, when should agre an agreement be submitted to Congress and when should it not. Um, and I was amused to see that the members of the group that had worked on the Hill uh, said uh, all the time, um, and the former negotiators said never. <laughs> so I think there's an, where you stand depends on where you sit. But it seemed to me that the Taiwan bill was an expression of congressional unhappiness with the current state of the process. So, and you think there might be, might be more? Oh, of course, that leads to the next question. Are there going to be other agreements that are worth Congress spending time on like they are, did on Taiwan? I'm skeptical this year. Just the level of dysfunction is uh, hard to overstate. And the lack of trust and the fact that there's uh, an empty schedule on Capitol Hill, but there's no time to work. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's very distressing. Um, I, and I don't know that it's going to work its way out until we have an election. Uh, one of the reasons I was somewhat reluctant to leave is I'm quite confident that Democrats will assume control of the House Maybe not the Senate, but if I had to choose, I'd much rather have control of the House. Uh, as Nancy Pelosi demonstrated, uh, with a three-vote margin, uh, she can run the place. Uh, and I think uh, Hakeem Jeffries and the Rich Neal and Democrats will be a good position to do that going forward. Let's talk for a minute about trade policy, because you alluded to this, and I, I think a lot of your uh, career is, has been, and trade has been, sort of emblematic of, of what the administration is trying to do, um, because they've articulated a, a new paradigm. I've always been a little bit disappointed, because the, the implication is that those of us that have been uh, stalwarts of the old paradigm have been wrong for 75 years. Um, and I mean, I'm, I haven't been wrong for 75 years. I, uh, in fact, I wasn't doing this uh, when I was- Only wrong for 60? Yeah, yeah. So I've been wrong for 60, thank you, uh, rather than 75. But uh, they're pursuing a trade policy for the workers, a trade policy for the middle class. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, uh, let me just take a step back, Bill. One of the things that I feel pretty strongly is that we end up making these things much more complex than they need to be, in part because we've got lots of certified smart people, lawyers, lobbyists, uh, experts floating around on this stuff. Um, and we, we make policy uh, opaque. 
and it shouldn't be. I mean, one of the areas that I feel most strongly about deals with pharmaceuticals. Why is it that American consumers pay the highest pharmaceutical prices in the world? The jobs are in India and China. The profits are flow to uh, companies that are taxed in Ireland or Switzerland. And we pay the price theoretically for innovation. I mean, I just think it is outrageous. Uh, um, the stock buybacks, you know, look at Pfizer, billions of dollars of stock buybacks, a Super Bowl ad, um, and we pay the price through the highest consumer prices um, as the, the price of innovation. So how does the trade policy for workers fix that? Well, I think by being able to focus on what it is we're trying to accomplish. Uh, being clear that we are go the, many of these trade policies that we have and infrastructure policies uh, to try and heal communities, deal with past mistakes, putting workers uh, centermost in terms of the impact it has on them. We've, uh, you know, the notion that we can't get trade adjustment assistance moving. That was my next question. Why not? <laughs> it seems to me to be obvious. But, it uh, is obvious. I mean, it's outrageous. In fact, what we did uh, when I was chairing the committee was to make some modest adjustments to strengthen it because it's not just uh, a, a few people as a result of trade. There's all sorts of economic imbalance where people pay the price. And having the authority to be able to strengthen the role that people have to, tr to deal with changes, whatever the or origin, um, has been lost. Do you see any signs of movement on this this year? I'm not optimistic. We're, we're, sort of, we're sort of stuck. I mean, the, the things that, uh, you know, that we did for, uh, for, for GSP, uh, the adjustments that we made and passed uh, were relatively modest. They're not inconsistent with what we did, for example, with the revised NAFTA. They are things that don't give heartburn to uh, most people in the business community, let alone citizens. Uh, being able to have some modest environmental protections, uh, dealing with gender violence. I mean, these are things that should not be that controversial. I think I read yesterday, probably from one of the reporters that's here, that uh, your, your Republican counterpart, Adrian Smith, said that uh, you're making progress on GSP, and he was reflecting some optimism about that. Is he right? If Adrian is optimistic, I'm optimistic. It just is frustrating to me that it's taken that long, and the areas that hung us up prior didn't look to me to be things that should be stumbling blocks. Yet they are, apparently, or still. But it's been expired now for what? We're in the fourth year of its yes. expiration. I think people are beginning to, uh, <laughs> beginning to get discouraged, I guess would be. Um, looking at what the administration's been trying to do, it, it seemed to, to us here at CSIS that there's a lot of focus on um, what I would say is traditional manufacturing, steel, heavy industry. I mean, there's a political argument for that, but putting the political argument aside, uh, is that really the right policy approach? You know, 75% of our economy is services. Should we be paying more attention to services and service workers? Uh, yes, but not to the exclusion of the manufacturing base. The manufacturing base has significant consequences in terms of social stability, in terms of uh, national defense. And these are, these are, this is not theoretical when we watch what's going on in Europe, uh, being uh, uh, dependent on the Chinese uh, and allowing them to uh, have these predatory practices and uh, any more than we should be dependent on them in terms of what we do with some of the pharmaceuticals. I think we need to have a, a broader approach. I think that it's not either or. Yes, the service industry is very important, but these traditional manufacturing have ripple effects 
that go far beyond just what happens in that factory in terms of supply chains and community integrity. Let, let me pursue a couple of, um, of specific things. Uh, and then audience, think of some questions. We'll get to you uh, shortly. Um, one of the issues that's been in the news lately, not really this week, but uh, in the last few months have been critical minerals agreements. Uh, partly, I think, spurred by the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, and it kind of opened the door to negotiating those. Um, that's, and I think those are seen as uh, really an important element of, of both friendshoring and the, the transition to green technologies. Uh, yet we don't seem to be doing much on them. We have one with Japan. <clears throat> Everything else either has slowed down, like with the EU or uh, at the UK, or hasn't started. Um, what does Congress think about the CMA issue? Is it, is it mostly, are you thinking about it mostly from the question of whether these are agreements you should review, or are you thinking about it from the question of whether this is a good approach or not? Well, I, I think uh, having uh, agreements laid out is a positive step forward. Uh, the, dealing with critical minerals uh, has other geopolitical implications, environmental implications. We have opportunities to uh, promote supply in the United States, but it's tricky. It has to be done right. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of these areas where I just think m we need to take the time to follow through on it, uh, to be patient, be focused. Uh, we have many similar interests with our friends in the European Union, for instance. I think these are uh, issues that can be bridged. Uh, and we all have a critical uh, uh, interest in critical minerals in terms of the, where the global economy needs to go. One of the issues that you mentioned in your <coughs> remarks that is on everybody's mind right now in a lot of respects is China. Uh, and there's a select committee uh, in the House on that subject, which just came out with 150 recommendations, uh, not all of them trade-related, but some of them trade-related. <clears throat> um, are any of them any good? And do you expect any action on China? Do you expect a China bill on the House this year? I think it's <coughs> highly likely that there will. Now, you've seen uh, there's been some uh, churn with the Republican chair of that bill, uh, Gallagher, um, created a firestorm by not being involved with the uh, sort of a meaningless impeachment and had the uh, clarity of, uh, of purpose and thought. Uh, and then retiring. And retiring. Uh, uh, and that, there's an epidemic of that going on. I mean, a number of people that I classify in the governing wing of the Republican Party feel that it's just not worth their while fighting that or that they can do it better as a civilian. But I think they've got, uh, they've done a lot of work. There is, uh, it is a target rich environment, even for this Congress, to be able to move things forward. Uh, Gallagher can give my de minimis speech better than I can, uh, although what the, what the committee has done, just simply adjusting the threshold for de minimis doesn't solve any problems. There's no value on precursors for um, uh, fentanyl, for instance, and as I mentioned, uh, these are theoretical anyway and nobody checks. But I think there will be enough uh, here that we will see things moving, if only because of the animus towards China and the, the behaviors that tend to um, uh, mobilize and focus the mind. I am hopeful that out of this, the de minimis threshold uh, will be adjusted uh, to take China out. It's pretty surgical, it's pretty simple, uh, and I'm uh, optimistic that this might be one of the results. What about PNTR? They, they didn't exactly recommend getting rid of it, but other members have proposed getting rid of it and putting, which would ha raise a lot of tariffs on China. Uh, what do you think of that, and is that something that the Congress might take up, or is that just one, one of the things that gets tossed out for well, media purposes? You notice the, sort of the drive-by tariff policy uh, of the uh, <laughs> Trump administration. The last administration, yes. Didn't, uh, didn't <laughs> inflict a lot of costs on American business and consumers, and did not seemingly change Chinese behavior. I mentioned the 400 years versus 4,000 years. 
that we've failed uh, to really uh, adjust uh, when we gave them uh, permanent uh, trading, uh, normal trading relations. Um, uh, I have no uh, concerns about uh, considering it, putting it out there. Uh, the same way I mentioned that uh, the notion that they haven't given us a procurement chapter and we let them bid on uh, projects in the United States, I'd stop it. I think that this is something that uh, there is no downside for us to be firm and consistent and fair. And what's going on here is not fair. The notion that somehow China is a developing economy when it serves their interests when they are in fact an economic powerhouse. And I just think we strip that away. Um, I think we can do it respectfully and have an orderly process, but I think sending, not just sending some signals, but taking some steps, and I would, for instance, uh, deal with procurement as one that's a, a very discreet one and getting rid of the de minimis threshold. These are things that are entirely defensible. They are supported by the public. There's support in Congress, and it sends a signal to our Chinese friends that, that we're not going to just be patsies. Again, I don't think we go on the war path, slap tariffs willy-nilly. Uh, there, I mean, there's some of these things that we should be dialing back. But um, I think we ought to use the tools that we've got, and I, 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 I tend to agree with uh, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, on some of these things. Um, because we don't want to be just playing it one-sided. And right now, I feel too often we are. Now, there are lots of common interests. We don't want to unspring everything. Our economies are integrated more than we care to admit. But that doesn't mean that we, are, that we cannot push back selectively in consultation so we're not surprising them. But they know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Let's uh, turn to a lot, more broadly Asia, not just China for the moment. And <clears throat> we've all been following IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And I at least was a little surprised that the trade pillar amounted to nothing in November, uh, despite having been briefed a week before that, that uh, uh, there was going to be at least an early harvest, which I thought was an odd term since we were two years into it. It wasn't exactly early, but uh, there was nothing really. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think happened and why and, and whether we're going to see a completion of that this year or is that now just waddling off into the sunset? Well, I mean, first of all, Bill, let me just say that uh, the administration, Catherine Tai, inherited uh, a mess. The relationships with people who should have been our family, China, um, okay, Canada is a, is a national security threat to the United States. Um, uh, I've had countless meetings with uh, uh, ambassadors, trade ministers, parliamentarians, who really are perplexed by what the United States position is and what we can rely, rely upon going forward. At a time when we're interdependent in terms of national security with uh, NATO, with Europe, and uh, former, uh, and, and with Russia. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it was a tangle. Uh, we were able to get some progress early with, uh, you know, Boeing and Airbus, and, uh, and there was, uh, an, uh, there have been efforts like what we did with the NAFTA revision. Um, but there's a lot of uh, ground to cover. There's a lot of healing to be done, building some trust. I mean, there are certain things with the uh, European Union that uh, ought to be pretty low-hanging fruit in terms of uh, the, we have common, they have higher labor standards than we do and environmental standards. We ought to be able to, I think, make some progress. Um, we've seen, for example, fishery, uh, uh, progress dealing with international fisheries, which I see a, a little bit of a bright spot. It's tough. Uh, getting 164 countries in the WTO moving in the same direction. But I, I found that to be encouraging. Um, uh, but the facts are they inherited a mess. It was not well executed by the previous administration. There's a lot of diverse opinions 
uh, in Congress between the, the parties. Uh, and it's, uh, it's tough sledding because it's going to be all politics uh, for the next eight months. Uh, so I have pretty low expectations that something's going to I'm not be achieved. I'm not detecting much optimism there about that. On IPEF... It's not optimism. I'm just trying to be realistic. We've not seen anything like this. Yeah. On, on IPEF, uh, we've done a lot of work here at the Schull Chair on, uh, on digital trade issues, mostly with respect to Europe, but, but also with respect to, to Asia. And it, it seemed to, uh, to me and to my colleagues that one of the reasons that we, they couldn't uh, or didn't bring the trade pillar across the finish line was the administration has gone into this period of rethinking its digital trade policy and has pulled back from previous uh, positions it had taken on, uh, on free flow of data, data localization, uh, providing source code, uh, uh, things like that. Um, how do you feel about that? Is that is administration on the right track well, or, or I, I, the wrong track? I think they're acknowledging that this is a field that's changing. I mean, AI, I mean, a, a number of these things uh, where there's not quite the consensus. There's, there are differences of opinion. Um, digital is important. Uh, I anticipate that this is an area that we can actually see some uh, some uh, progress, particularly if Democrats take control of the House again. Um, uh, but it reflects, I think, some of the, the, the churn and uncertainty that we're seeing where not everybody is in, in agreement. We've got a um, the WTO ministerial conference is coming up soon. We're on the cusp of that. <clears throat> For a commercial here, for those of you who listen to the Trade Guys podcast, next week, uh, we're going to have a fish expert, and we're going to be discussing fish, because I, I, you're quite right uh, that one of the accomplishments of the last ministerial was a fisheries agreement, but it, it was not the whole thing. It was only part, and what's on the table now is the rest of it. Um, are you optimistic about the ministerial? I've, I had, was in a meeting last week where someone, not in the government, suggested that, you know, 13 is an unlucky number. Maybe we should just <laughs> skip this one and go to the 14th. Uh, do you have any, are, are you hopeful that they're going to do anything on fish or, or reform, dispute no. settlement reform or well, e-commerce or anything? Well, I hope, for instance, we can continue uh, the progress with the fisheries. We're not done with that yet. I think it's a very, very promising development. I'd like to, to be able to focus on a few things like this and be able to finish them or at least make more progress. Uh, but it's, the meeting is taking place uh, in the midst of unprecedented turmoil. I mean, we've got a war raging uh, in Europe, chaos in the Middle East, great heartburn uh, in this country in terms of a number of these things. The politics we've talked about already, we don't need to probably uh, flog it. I think the context in which this is taking place makes it extraordinarily challenging. That's why I'd, I'd hope that we're able to zero on some smaller areas and continue to make progress and refinement. Um, this might be uh, one of the few bright spots. We, but we need to keep talking. This, is a, a, this forum is so valuable, uh, it's important that we try and nurture it wherever we can uh, because it's, there are very few areas like this that we can point to that we, uh, where we have this opportunity. Are you going to the no. ministerial? No. Is anybody uh, from the Congress besides staff? Well, staff will be there, uh, but it's, uh, uh, I, I think there will be very few people that will, uh, that will attend. Well, Let's, um, I've got one more, I've, I've got some more questions, but I want to give the audience a chance. But let me uh, close this part with one for you. I, uh, and I can speak from someone who's older than you. You're much too young to retire. Uh, look at Biden. You know, there's, 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 life, uh, yeah. there's life beyond 70. Um, I assume you have a third act. Uh, you want to tell us your plans, or is this something to be developed? Well, uh, something that's going to happen is I'm not going to spend 15 hours a week on airplanes and in airports. 
uh, which I am very much looking forward to. But basically, I want to do what I'm doing now. There are a whole series of things that, in terms of infrastructure, environment, uh, that I want to continue in terms of livability. There's some problems back home in Portland that I want to focus on. Um, I'm looking forward to addressing them as a civilian, uh, not being bogged down with the, the politics that are increasingly less satisfying. But I anticipate that I'll do much of what I do now in terms of um, public media, animal welfare, environment, infrastructure, uh, but just not entangled with day-to-day -day politics. Well, let's see if we have audience questions. Do we have a, I guess there's a small enough room, we don't need the microphone. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand, and there's one there. Tell us who you are, and make sure you ask a question, and not give a speech, and wait for the microphone. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, well, I guess I, I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Congressman. Um, my question, I just want to circle back to your comments on China um, and their importation of you know, dangerous and illicit and illegal um, goods and CPPs relative to the ability to stop that. Um, do you have any plans in your remaining time in Congress or know of any plans um, to further kind of inhibit this specifically with regards to pharmaceuticals? Um, you know, FDA released um, recently reports that there was counterfeit Ozempic um, and other replica and counterfeit goods coming into the U.S. Do you have any plans to stop that? Well, I referenced my concern to make an adjustment uh, to the de minimis loophole. That will reduce 60% uh, of these billion packages, reduce the burden on Customs and Border Patrol, a signal that we're serious. Um, I think that this would be an important step forward. But the further we get into this in terms of the things that are crossing the border, un that's not just de minimis, um, this is a serious problem. We have under-resourced the Customs and Border Patrol, and I think their interest, you know, to try and refine their operations. We need to, uh, things that we do with uh, trusted traders, I mean, they're, uh, in terms of uh, fr uh, free trade uh, zones that, that, that can help modify some of this. Um, and it's, it's not popular to talk about investing in border security any more than what we're talking about in terms of immigration but making those investments are necessary for the systems to work. Uh, it's not particularly attractive when you're investing in bureaucrats and process, uh, but I think there's no alternative uh, to being able to get control of the, of the borders, the flow of goods, and be able to, most importantly, protect the people who play by the rules, who are getting short shrift, I think. Right here in the front row. I know you have a question. Merrily International Trade today. Um, there was a letter that the House Select Committee wrote to Catherine Tai um, talking about the auto sector in China. And Catherine Tai wrote back and she said, I, like you, am concerned with Chinese companies establishing operations in Mexico and avoiding the 301 tariffs by producing in Mexico and getting uh, USMCA tariff benefits. Of course, the way the law is right now, as long as significant enough production is done in Mexico, it doesn't matter whether it's a state-owned enterprise of China that's doing it. Um, it counts as Mexican, with Mexican workers providing the value add. Should Congress change the law so that BYD can't open a factory in Mexico and make electric cars and send them here through USMCA? I, I am definitely open to that. I mean, they're trying to make sure that our, our trade rules have some uh, impact. Uh, admittedly, uh, I mean, in terms of transshipment, these are uh, long-standing uh, concerns. Right, but, but it's not transshipment if all the yeah, done yes. in Mexico. It's, it's Mexican work, but just Chinese and, and capital flow is a, a legitimate area of, of inquiry. Um, these, uh, it's not easy when we have these economies that are interacting, we have uh, investments that are made uh, in these countries, but I think having uh, control of, of companies, dealing with 
uh, capital uh, requirements, uh, working cooperatively with the Mexicans. I think there are, we have a number of common interests that if we uh, haven't had a chance to try and fine tune some of this, I think some things can happen. I'm, uh, but I'm not willing to uh, abandon the notion that we have a chance to be able to push back and be able to per, uh, uh, support the, uh, the, the concept that we have of trying to minimize it. If I, I, if I can add to that, I'm not, I'm not being interviewed, but I can't resist. I think that's going to, how well that works is going to depend in part on how those companies construct their supply chains uh, and where the parts and components come from. Um, because the question will be, what will they qualify? Can they avoid the, the Trump 25% tariff? <clears throat> can they uh, qualify under USMCA? Uh, can they qualify for, if it's electric, can they qualify for the IRA credits? All different criteria, all different standards, um, and it'll really depend on how they construct their supply chains. Uh, and it looks like Congress may make it harder uh, for them, but um, it's a little too early, I think, to say exactly what they're going to do. Uh, and you're right, they're, it's going to benefit Mexican workers unless they bring a lot of Chinese workers over, uh, which has happened in other contexts in other countries. Another question? Yes, right be, uh, yes, second row. Hi, Melinda, St. Louis Public Citizen. Um, getting uh, back to the question about the critical minerals agreements, I think uh, one, a question I have is I know that Indonesia has been pushing hard for a critical minerals agreement. I think there was a lot of concern by um, environmentalists and uh, labor activists, human rights activists around the, uh, and advocates around the US-Japan deal and the lack of binding and enforceable standards uh, in that um, deal. I'm just curious what your, and I know you expressed some concerns about that as well, but so specifically for Indonesia, um, what you think would need to be on the table, um, given the, you know, the extreme patterns of environmental forced la you know, degradation, forced labor in the well, mining sector well, in Indonesia? That's one of the concerns I had with the agreement we had with uh, Japan, sidestepping the opportunity to explore these issues to try and uh, clarify uh, how this supply chain is going to play out. We have huge issues in terms of Indonesia, uh, in terms of labor practices, in terms of environmental protections. Um, I uh, welcome an opportunity for us to deal with this publicly, for us to uh, have uh, hearings and discussions, have people uh, in, the, in the Indonesian government share uh, the impact that they are facing in terms of the practices for the production of this, in terms of what happens to workers, what happens to the environment. Uh, these critical minerals we need to protect the environment, but if we don't do it properly, uh, the damage can be uh, devastating. And that's been the pattern that we've seen around the world where uh, environmental protections get short shrift. Uh, we need to, to make sure that they are taken into account. The same way dealing with um, uh, the, the workforce. Uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, police uh, efforts that, that, that deal with exploitive labor practices, children, um, and it's uh, worthy of our trying to work with them together. There are some reputational issues with corporations uh, in the supply chain. Um, I, I think there's some latitude to try and provide greater protections for people who need it, and the public needs to understand what we're doing, and that's a role that Congress can play um, with the hearing process and perhaps providing a framework. Okay, we have time for one more, and then I have uh, one, too. Let's right here in the front row. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, my name is Femi, and I'm a Nigerian. My question is a follow-up from the lady's question or the woman's question there. The Chinese are using a tripod system in the AGOA agreement system with the African continent. They're doing a third-party shipping and make it look like it's from Africa. Uh, my real question to you is what is the U.S. outlook on trade agreement with the African continent? Hence, we are going to be the 
higher population in the future, and a lot of the raw materials and rare earth is in the continent, the outlook of the U.S. policy. Thank you. Well, you're going to see, I think, a great deal more focus, uh, even with this Congress, uh, dealing with Africa. We've got uh, the, the reauthorization of uh, uh, Goa. Uh, the, uh, we've had a number of very interesting meetings with representatives of African countries. The, the committee is interested in understanding more and, and de developing those uh, relationships. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a, a significant amount of progress going forward, given how important Africa is going to be in terms of population, in terms of uh, important products, and the geopolitical implications. So I have a last one, which you may not want to answer, but you've been here through five presidents. Uh, which one was the most effective in dealing with Congress? Well, um, Bill Clinton was the slickest and could talk people into almost anything. Uh, but as a practical matter, Joe Biden has been the most effective in terms of things that I care about. We've got a, a president for the first time that actually cares about rebuilding and renewing America. We've the, the economic uh, impact in terms of uh, inflation reduction, in terms of infrastructure, chips and science. Um, uh, the, it's been masterful with, with Biden and his team, and it's hard to argue with the results. Uh, so I place them as the most effective in things that I care about, uh, but he's not the, he's not the slickest uh, in terms of, uh, and I, I don't know that slick is, is that important. Uh, I served in the Clinton administration, and what we always said at the time, you know, if you gave him 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one with everybody in the country, they'd all vote for him. <laughs> well, I, absolutely. I, I, I will never forget, I had a, an opportunity to uh, be with him essentially for a 16-hour day campaigning in Oregon. And it was just amazing. First of all, you know, you get sucked into the, the Clinton magic, but he never stopped. We had an entire day's worth of activities, and then he went back at midnight to the hotel to a studio for a radio broadcast, and then he was going to deal with some world leader on the phone. It was just kind of exhausting to, to watch, but he never stopped, and it was amazingly effective. Well, on that note, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Congressman, for giving us your thoughts. Pleasure to have you. Thank you.